My name is Sister Claire McGowan. I'm one of the Dominicans of Peace from St. Catherine here in Springfield. And we're welcoming you tonight to the ninth Moving Forward Forum, sponsored by New Pioneers for a Sustainable Future. We have these forums once a quarter, and it's an effort to engage the residents of our tri-county area in conversations about sustainability and about what we need to do differently to ensure that our future will be sustainable. So the title of tonight's forum is This Place We Call Home. Um, and our, our panelists are three very wonderful people from the Tri-County area. Martha Young from the East Texas community. Many of you who read the Springfield Sun recognize Martha's name because she often writes columns about um, things related to sustainability. And uh, Martha was uh, the director of um, two hospital laboratories before her retirement. So she brings a health perspective as well as a sustainability perspective. And Laura Riccardi Livers is a new resident of Marion County, relatively new over the last few years. Um, Laura is the um, biodynamic gardener at Fox Hollow Farm, which is a well-known, very highly respected farm in Oldham County. And um, ma um, Laura is married to Philip Livers, who is a pork farmer in Loretto, Kentucky. And finally, Daniel Barber, who's a resident of Valley Hill. Daniel was, for several years, the organic gardener for the Dominican Earth Center at St. Catherine. And then he went on and studied to become an RN and currently is um, a nurse at Ephraim McDowell Hospital in Danville. So our panel tonight brings a, a good breadth of experience and each of them has a strong passion for sustainability. So I know the conversations tonight, tonight is going to be very interesting. Um, one of the things that we want to help people become aware of tonight is that um, new pioneers and a group of interested citizens are planning a green festival, the first annual Springfield Green Festival, which will be on April 26th, the last Saturday of April, at the Farmer's Market in Springfield and all of that surrounding area down there. Um, and we think it's going to be a very wonderful event and hope that many people from the community and from beyond the community will be interested enough to come out and learn from what happens at the sustainability at the Green Festival. So without further ado, we'll ask each of our panelists to speak for about 10 minutes about their particular area of interest. And then there'll be a conversation among the three panelists. And then we'll invite our audience to join in the conversation. So Martha, would you like to begin? All right. Uh, before I start, I want to uh, let you all know, too, my, the rest of my background. I'm married to an organic, sort of, natural farmer. We have a, a farm out in the East Texas area. And so I come from the farm, although I'm not a farmer. I just uh, clean up the mud and cook the meals. <laughs> can, can the garden. <laughs> Clara asked me to talk about our place here in Kentucky and how we regard ourselves as stewards and caregivers of the land. So I would like to go back 200 years ago and look at the land like it was in 1765. The Revolutionary War was just winding down. The East Coast had been settled over the past 100 years by a variety of people coming from Europe. And the control of the land west of the Appalachian Mountains was rapidly being given up by Spain and France. The Carolinas and the Virginia borders were filling up with people who were looking for a homestead. In 1769, for two years, Daniel Boone and his brother Squire roamed the Kentucky wilderness. And they were scouting. They were looking. 
Daniel, of course, loved the wilderness. They stayed out there for two years. In 1775, James Herod scouted the Harrodsburg area. Before long, word of the Great Meadow, which is how Daniel called it, got back to the people on the other side of the mountain. And we had a flood of people coming in. They came down the Ohio, they got off at the falls and came up the Salt River. Or they came over the Cumberland Gap and they settled in this area. These families have been here for generations. Um, they came into central Kentucky and they found what looked, I'm sure, like heaven. Free land for all practical purposes. Most of the state was covered with forests. Trees were six, eight, ten feet in diameter. Poplar, sycamore, oak, chestnut, walnut. They had been undisturbed for years, hundreds of years. They found a moderate climate, plenty of fresh water, sands of native grasses, fertile virgin soil with a limestone base, especially in the central part of the state. There were no permanent Indian settlements and the hunting parties of Indians seemed to be tolerable at that point in time when they first came in. The land had abundant wildlife, the streams were full of fish. Picture in your mind's eye how that land looked at that time. Can you imagine what that must have looked like? If you've ever been around virgin timber, it's, it's awe-inspiring. And the whole state of Kentucky, almost 90% was covered with this kind of forest. Make a note that one of the reasons that people were ready to leave the eastern coastland was that the land there had been farmed to where it had lost its productivity. And this was before fertilizer, of course. So they were looking for fresh land, virgin land. So at that point, at this point, we have to ask what makes a place like Kentucky attractive? What is it that you need to make a living on land? And there are three things. Plenty of fresh water, a tillable, productive land or earth, and a temperate climate. And Kentucky had all three. The first settlers were quick to recognize it. Word got back and before long we had a lot of people coming here. So now we have to fast forward to today and consider what 200 years of living here in this land have changed the environment. The forests are gone, the great forests are gone. There are only two areas of virgin forest in Kentucky and they're both in protected preserves. The land is still fertile, but much of the land that was cleared of trees was not suited for farming and has gone back to scrub woodland. Our urban areas have covered some of the most productive land, but the biggest threat by far to Kentucky land is sprawl. When every country road is lined with houses and large yards that are only mowed, we've lost a lot of productive land. So I have to ask the question, do we really want all our country roads to look like a subdivision? We need to start thinking about that. That's where our land is going. Without some thoughtful planning for the preservation of farmland, will we continue, and this is a question I think everybody in this area has to ask, will we continue to let the best farmland disappear to sprawl? Our next focus has to be the water streams, our fresh water streams that cover our state. When I was a child, I learned to swim in Knob Creek, about a mile from where the Lincoln Farm was. Now it's not safe. I wouldn't let a child go in that waterway. There are very few water streams in the state that are safe to swim in. Runoff from farm chemicals and pollution has made most of our water dangerous. Chemicals such as atrazine are found in 75% of stream water, 80% of drinking water systems, due to its high use for crops such as corn and other crops. We see more of the marginal land in these three counties devoted to corn and across the state. We're inevitably filling our streams with chemicals that have long lasting effects on our bodies. Atrazine stays around for a long time. Uh, something like 15 years ago it was banned in Europe and France is still finding it in the soil. Are we headed to repeat the dangerous path of California water management? where the abuse of the fresh water creates a situation of drought and water shortages. Think back to the years of the droughts here, 1970s, we remember them. 
how the land lay parched and brown. We can manage dry years by careful use of our water because we still have adequate rainfall over the period of time. If we protect our waterways we, by streamside buffer areas, by preserving tree cover, by water conservation, and expanding of forests on marginal land, all these things protect fresh water, which is a valuable resource, and Kentucky is blessed. There's an organization dedicated to fresh water that I would recommend to you if you're not familiar with it. It's called Kentucky Waterways Alliance. It, here's their newsletter. It comes out four times a year, and I've got some, the newsletter and some applications if you're interested. I follow their newsletter all the time. They talk about um, selenium out of the, the fill in the mountains from strip mining, and they also talk about chemicals from agricultural runoff. And the last condition that makes Kentucky such a pleasant home to all of us is the, the temperate climate. We're blessed with long summers where two garden seasons are possible, abundant rainfall most years, just enough really hot days to appreciate a cold drink, and just enough winter days to control the bugs <laughs> and appreciate spring when it comes. <laughs> but I have to note that in the last few days I've seen in the paper, in spite of this unusually cold winter, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration reported January the fourth warmest month of January on record. I know that a lot of people dispute climate change and are carefully looking for reasons to ignore these reports, but temperature readings from around the globe cannot be ignored. It's clear that coastal areas are at risk from rising seawaters and weather systems that are more destructive than the past. With a Katrina and a Sandy, both in the recent past, how can we refuse to acknowledge the reality that warming the atmosphere has created a volatile response by nature that will continue to give us more extreme weather events. Having said that, I think here in Kentucky we're protected by our location and we may see an influx of people from climates where they're not so protected. Which goes back, as far as I can see, to the need now to put protections in place for land preservation, water purity, and protection of what we have in this state. Daniel Boone's land is gone, but we still have a lot of the beauty that attracted the first settlers. Are we going to let it slip away by neglect and individual greed that ignores the environment? Will another hundred years do to this land? What will it do to this land that we love? One last comment. When I was researching this commentary, I found Dr. Thomas Clark's observations on Kentuckians. He called us rugged individualists with an abiding love and attachment for our family and place, a rooted, deep-seated belief that this is the best place on earth. Let's hope that translates into caring for the land our ancestors found when they came over the mountains and down the Ohio 200 years ago. Thank you, Martha. That was wonderful. You're welcome. Laura? Did you say this last January that was 14 or 13 warmest? The fourth warmest. January was the fourth warmest. Fourth. This, this year, 2000. Uh, this past year, yes. Uh huh. 2012. 2014. This past year, yes, uh huh. It was just in the Courier Journal. I just saw it recently. Yeah. Now they're taking an average temperature around, around the globe. Yes, uh huh. So, yeah, they're they're taking temperatures all over the world. <laughs>